On the Terrors of Tubi podcast, we cover a lot of horror. Today, we have one of the most divisive episodes we've done yet, breaking down The Love Witch. Lots of disagreements, lots of confusion, lots of challenging opinions on this episode, raising questions like, is this a good movie? Is this a bad movie? Is it even a horror movie? Stick around and find out as we dive into Anna Biller's 2016 cult hit, the Love Witch. Calling all scream queens, gore hounds, video nasties, and final girls. Turn up the lights and turn on the horror as we explore Tubi's frightening video vaults with the terrors of Tubi podcast. No one is safe as we hit horror history, commentary, and more with your host, the Terror Squad. Right, I well, I don't get that. Well, all of us <laughs> pulling up the movie to check the first thing. To avoid fainting, keep repeating. It's only a podcast. Only a podcast. Only a podcast. Hello and welcome to the Terrors of Tubi. I'm Ryan. This is Joe. I'm Laura. And I am DT. And we are the entire team of Terrors of Tubi. We have a really special episode for you today. We watched The Love Witch. And based off of sort of the rumblings from the group, we sound like we have a pretty good split on opinions over this one. That's exciting. I know, right? I know. I'm so excited. So um, let's talk about it. Let's let's kind of get into sort of maybe why that's a sort of a thing. And then we'll go into ratings after that. Because I'm going to say, I think, speaking for myself, that I think I have some theories on why maybe some people didn't like it and why some people liked it more and that sort of thing. And, I, and speaking from my own experience of like when I first saw it, I, I think I can kind of you know, make some suggestions for our audience too. And then Laura, I know you've seen it multiple times. So if you want to chime in too, please jump in oh, and I will. give me your thoughts too. <laughs> and then after this, and then, you know, and then maybe Joe and um, DT, you guys can let us know like what you guys kind of think about that. And then we'll just kind of go into it. Like we'll go into like what everyone rates this. Like, you know, is this more of like a movie, but that's by yourself or is it more of a movie for the group? That sort of thing. So, okay. As far as uh, this movie goes, this is my fourth time watching the movie. First time I watched it, it was it was it was kind of a slog for me. I gotta say, I totally agree. The first time I saw it, I thought it was pretty slow. I thought it was pretty, but I was like, mm. but this was also uh, in preparation to watch this my fourth time, um, and I really liked it this time. Like I, yeah. I've liked it more every time I've watched it. So I'm really excited to kind of talk through all of that and uh, maybe make it a, uh, in hindsight, a more uh, rich experience for the folks who were not as into it. For people who have never seen this movie and are listening to us talk about this right now, why did you come back to it a second time? Well, in truth, because um, I had liked it well enough and I actually, <laughs> I was I was home with my mom who um, isn't super into her, but she really likes witch stuff. And I think she had just finished like some show or whatever and was looking for something else. And, you know, she was that that era, you know, I thought would speak to her. So we ended up watching it. And um, that time I was like, OK, yeah. Watching it with somebody else was was interesting, um, and I liked it enough that time to then want to revisit it again myself, just you know, randomly, and then of course a more directed uh, formal watch for yeah. uh, for this. For this, yeah, I think my my second time was actually right after the first time. Like I watched it the first time, and I was like, man, this is so slow. And then I got to the end, and I was like, wait a minute, hold on a second, I'm like totally missing something. So then I watched it a second time, which is not an easy thing to do either because the length of this movie is two hours long. I mean, it is, you know, it's not like a quick 90 minutes and it's out. It takes its time. But my second time, I really fell in love with it more. What I really appreciated about this watch was that um, after doing some reading and understanding Anna Biller's background a little bit more, every single detail is meticulously thought out. And there are a couple things that are really easy to miss that I'm really hoping that we'll have time to talk about just because the... The precision, I feel like every single choice was made for a reason and came to, even if it's not a movie that we love, it's the exact movie she wanted to make. Yeah. Um, so I thought that was pretty great. I'm going to jump in real quick and say, anyone want to give the log line for this movie? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let, uh, listeners, um, we will, you know, stop holding you back from hearing what this movie is about and we'll kind of uh, jump into it. Does anyone want to try the log line first or do you want me to go for it? I have an idea after I did it. a terrible on our last uh, episode, <laughs> but uh, let, me, let me try unwitting uh, femme fatale X. Uh, unwitting femme fatale's sexual allure leads stupid men to their demise. Ooh, 
Whoa. Except let's take the un in unwitting and just scribble it out in <laughs> <laughs> You don't want to get witch in there at all? I mean, that's what the movie's, you know, it, that's in the title, right? I mean, we can throw witch in there, but I... No, I stand by mine. <laughs> With Laura's edit. I would make uh, a plea for including which because, and I'm sorry, Ryan, you're going to have your work cut out for you in editing because I'm, I, I'm going to be pontificating. But um, Go for it. I, I think a witch is a really important use of metaphor in, uh, in this film because – Witches, and I think they even specifically address this in the film, have so often been used as sort of like a cultural shorthand for um, men's fear of a woman who has power derived from somewhere beyond or without a man, and specifically via the use of sexuality and and subverting traditional family structures. You know, you have witches that will literally eat children, you know, and Bruin families and da 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 da. So, so on the one hand, you have that, but on the other hand, a uh, philosopher who I have seen invoked a lot when talking about this movie is a uh, Simone de Beauvoir, who mm. wrote um, a book called *The Second Sex*. I think it was at the end of the forties, um, and her main argument posits that uh, women in the twentieth, and I think it can now be extrapolated to the twenty-first century. Um, are second-class citizens. And in this book, she examines different archetypes. And one of them is what's called the woman in love. Hmm. And the woman in love, she theorizes, cannot come up with an identity of her own, has no identity outside the context of relationships. And I, I think we see that in Elaine in that if she's not actively with a man, she is calculating how she's going to get the next one. And even when and we'll talk about this probably too, like she doesn't ever really have success connecting with anyone because no one's ever going to fit her fantasy. But um, but having the duality of the witch as like using that sexuality as a weapon, but then also watching her in sort of this like patriarchal patriarchal trap is really interesting and sort of uh, confuses and um, complicates the gender politics of the film. So I don't know. I think you got to put witch in there. So what about uh, a witch using love magic leads unsuspecting male lovers to their deaths? Can they still be stupid? <laughs> yes. yes. Please. <laughs> unsuspecting stupid male lovers. Are there. <laughs> so stupid. Yeah. I think we're going to add that. Well, then yeah. let's get into it. Let's go. Let's like talk about initial ratings. Yeah. So this, you know, uh, just a heads up to the audience. I have not seen this four times. This was my first time watching it. And uh, I think that it was a slog. Uh, two hours felt too long to me. Um, and I would say individually, I would give this one. And, and I do want to say I want to watch it again because I talked to you guys about it afterward. I definitely miss some stuff and I think I would have a newfound appreciation for it. But first viewing, I'd give it like a four and a half out of 10 on an individual. I think as a group watch, it's a little more fun. There's There are some fun, mo fun moments in there and visually, it's really beautiful to look at. I'd probably go maybe a 5.5 .5 for a group. DT, you want to give a rating? Um, sure. And, and I'm just going to echo what everybody has said in the group. I guess as an individual watch, and I kind of have to qualify this a little bit because in terms of just the overall movie, I would probably give it in the same range, probably a four. But in terms of just like an independent director doing her thing and pretty much doing everything, there, 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 there is a deep respect there. I would probably give it a six or seven um, out of ten because, I mean, from a, an aesthetic standpoint, it was amazing, and I love the genre. Period, and I love, I love what she did there. Um, for a group watch, depending on what group, <laughs> you know, <laughs> depending on what group, like you know, if I'm with you know a lot of my homegirls, then I think we can have a more of an appreciation for it. Yeah. So I probably give it maybe like a five and a half, six out of ten. But if I'm with a whole bunch of dudes and I'm just gonna be very honest about it, you know, it'll probably be a three out of ten. But if you if you like the, the I guess the period that she is executing on, um, and you from an independent film filmmaker perspective, I think she did a phenomenal job and I respect her for it. Okay. 
Well, DT, I actually feel like uh, your point about the audience and uh, who you'd be watching it with is really important. I don't think this is one that I would bust out for a casual viewer, but <laughs> if I'm if I'm back in college, you know, taking taking film classes and like getting drunk with a bunch of my female classmates and like, whee, Laura Belby. So, you know, well, uh, <laughs> we can talk about some of that later. But <laughs> at this point, now having seen it that many times, having read what I've read and sort of coming to it, I'm I think I'm living at maybe a 7.5 out of 10. Um, but I really do hope also that we can talk about uh, some of the auteur stuff for 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 her because um, I think that that sort of e- raises mine even more on that respect um, scale that DT was mentioning. It's, it's really incredible that this movie got made the way it did. Okay. On an individual watch, I would actually give this like an eight, maybe an eight, eight and a half, actually, honestly, to be truthful. Now, well, maybe now I will too. <laughs> as, far, <laughs> as far as a group watch, as far as a group watch, I have to agree. I, I don't think it's, um, I don't think it's, it's one for a group. I, especially like if you're like setting up a group and you're like, you know what, we're going to put on a horror movie. We're going to put on a really scary movie. And then you put on the love, Witch. like, I don't think, I don't think people will think of this movie and go, Oh, this is a horror movie more people will sort of try to figure out and like try to get ahead of the film and be like, is this like black dynamite? Have you guys ever seen black dynamite? Yeah. I think, I think initially, like if people were to sit down with this, they would try to be like, Oh, is this like that film? Like not, maybe not even seeing black dynamite, but they would be looking for like the parody, right? The humor in it all. There are moments of humor, but it's played pretty straight as far as like the tone and the acting goes. I think I I could be wrong, but that's, that's my impression of it. I I had a, a, For me, like I thought they really played on the exploitation, like that type of like kind of cheesy acting, especially with like the male characters, right? Like, you know, like like I thought it was very well casted. Yeah. First of all, uh, and with the male characters, at first, like I was a little bit, and this is just my male ego getting in a way. Like I was a little bit offended. I'm like, these guys are stupid. They're just like (laughs) falling into these. They fall into the trap. What are they doing? But, like, as the film goes on, like, I, I kind of see what she's going for there. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, in terms of just, like, the style, exploitation, those type of films, I, I thought she nailed the cheesiness. Um, and I, I know, like, there is, like, a mixed bag in terms of, like, a lot of people saying, like, they didn't like it. But, like, if you look at if you see a lot of those, like, exploitation films of the 60s and 70s, like, I, I thought she did a really good job of, like, staying true to that type of acting. She did. Definitely she did. And she, um, I know she's listed a lot of movies uh, that, ha- like, had an influence on her sort of putting this together. But I yeah. think, um, I don't know if you guys have ever seen the exploitation film uh, from the 70s called The Velvet Vampire. But, like, that was, like, the movie that was running through my head the whole time. It's all about this couple who go out to the desert and they meet up with this eccentric kind of countess who's actually a vampire. And, like, it kind of turns into, like, this erotic thriller type thing so like, like dracula's like, daughter but the 70s exactly that's exactly right yep with black dynamite though the humor is like in your face right like i remember yeah. this one specific scene where he's like getting his kung fu pose and then the the mic dips into the frame they take a whole minute in the movie to like look at the mic you they bring the the uh, audience in on the humor whereas this is more like i feel like she's kind of setting the characters in this time period to <laughs> elevate like the feminist <laughs> point that this movie's trying to make i think right where well, she's i want to go back just a little bit it's talking about kind of like the sub genre within these exploitation films, because yeah. like, I think a lot of the black exploitation films are very like over the top and outlandish. Yeah. Right. And so I think black dynamite played very, very well on that, which with, with this exploitation film, I, I like the, like there is a lot of exploitation films that are very cheesy. Yeah. So true. like, you know, so for, I think, so I think that's the route she took um, with this particular film. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, and so and that's why I really enjoyed because you do get that dyna- dynamic when you watch black exploitation films as opposed to white exploitation. That's a good point. Um, I also want to talk for a second about um, the sort of I don't want to use the word muddy, but like maybe uh, more subtle uh, uh, attempts at humor. Mm-hmm. In that, um, so I, I ran into that same t- uh, that same thing the first time I watched it, trying to be like, is this is this pastiche? Is this is this satire? Is it you know? And so I I also I just read um, an interview that um, that Biller did with a friend 
or but that she was talking with a friend and she showed him the trailer and he's like, oh, it's a comedy. And she's like, it's a tragedy. And I kind of think it's, it's kind of both, right? And I do think like, so I understand the criticism of maybe the humor not going hard enough. However, what I would like to pitch is that um, it's even more because she says she makes these movies for women. And for me, this humor is the kind of humor that like, forgive me, but a dude is doing something stupid and a, a woman catches eyes with a woman across the room and is like, come on, you know? And I think, I think when, um, when women are doing provocative humor that will challenge men. Um, and this is just how we have to navigate the world anyway, that if you're too direct, um, you'll get shut down, you'll get challenged, you'll get called a bitch or worse. So I think she has to do this comedy and this satire and kind of like a Socratic method way, right? She's sort of asking these questions and leading to be like, well, do you see why this is ridiculous? And, you know, so I just think that um, what I before would have seen perhaps as a as a, um, a con or a drawback to it, I actually appreciate more at this point. That's awesome. All right, well, let's start talking about then, uh, I, I guess, like the synopsis. We open up the movie with our main character, Elaine, the love witch, driving in a bright red Mustang and she's leaving San Francisco and going up north to the Redwoods, right? To find a new small town, right? And we get flashbacks of Jerry, her ex-husband, who has passed away. And it's sort of inferred that maybe he was poisoned. And I think you get that point sort of right from the beginning, right? Like, Yeah, he's drinking yes. out of a chalice and yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. falls over into the spotlight, which kind by the way, the top, like, yeah, it's totally over the top. And yes, outside the exterior shot is pretty cool. But like you start getting touches of the color and everything else in this movie. And it's like, oh, okay, this is going to be a vibe. This is cool. And um, it's fun to watch her sort of like think the think through of like her past and like with the VO going, what's she's saying in her VO compared to what's being shown on the screen are sort of more extreme versions, right? Of like what's what's happening, I think, in her head. She's like, oh, I'm all better now. And then it cuts to like her in like this weird witch session where there's like naked people all around her and she's tied up <laughs> with a blindfold over her face. It's just funny to me. Like, I guess that's like one of the moments where I was like, oh, okay, this is going to have a little bit of humor to it too. Yes. And I think, I think, you know, we'll probably get to talk about this, but it's really interesting, especially in the the scene at the burlesque bar, which we'll we'll get to later. But that it's that complicated question of when women use sexuality as a weapon, um, to what point is that empowerment and self possessed, and what part of it is still uh, submitting to um, you know patriarchal uh, male gaze phenomena? Because like, yes, you're using it to get what you want, but yeah. you're still uh, objectifying yourself um which we see her even start to do like the sex as a weapon uh when she gets pulled over just now and you know like turns it up to a thousand of like what you officer how can i help you you know whatever not subtle at all no not subtle at all and i just want to warn everyone listening uh, there are going to be a ton of spoilers we're just going to go through them so if you if you uh, are trying to save this movie for yourself before you see it and uh, don't want to hear anything, don't go any further because we're going to get into it because there are a lot of spoilers happening like right yeah, off the beginning. N- there's no way to dissect this movie without spoilers. Right, just exactly. Don't. Yeah. Okay, Run so away. you've had your chance. Bye. All right, so for those who stuck around, she gets pulled over and the cop that pulls her over is Griff. Is that him? That's him, right? Yeah. I didn't Griff. think so. No. Oh, I man, Griff, I missed that. Dude. I thought Griff pulled What's... her over. And then when we see him next, he's in the office, and his female police officer goes, congratulations on the promotion. Oh. He was promoted. Yeah. 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 Right? Am I wrong? Well, well, I don't get that. Well, is that right? <laughs> All of us pulling wow. up the movie to check the first thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm pretty sure she gets pulled over by Griff for her tail beat out. I well, could be wrong. We'll let, we'll let the audience call you out later if you're yeah, wrong. Yeah. I'll, def- I'll defer to you. Yeah. Continue. 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 Actually. <laughs> So yeah, so then she she gets pulled over and she tries to basically work her mojo on this guy. And he just kind of goes, yeah, it's it's fine. Just, you know, get it fixed. Uh, Don't worry about it. And off she goes into the small town where she shows up to a beautiful house, by the way. That house is amazing. And it looks like a castle. A total castle. Yeah. Okay, bye. Yeah. 
<laughs> hop in seriously but you also get a touch of like what this how this world's gonna work right because she shows up in her red mustang and up to this point we've kind of gotten the idea that maybe this is going to be like some movies set in the 60s but then right in front of the house pulls up like a brand new bmw right and then right. all the cars behind her as she's walking up at the house are all sort of out of a different time period so it's a yeah. weird vibe already of like what her world is compared to what the world around her is i think also, can we talk about, because we're already starting to see it, like Biller is using Shyamalan levels of red in this movie. Oh, red is all over this movie. And I just wonder, you know, we may get more into it later, but what y'all make of, of that? Like, it's pretty like hit you over the head with it. Oh, I love it. I love it. I absolutely do. And I think I was, actually, you know, I, one thing I did leave out and I should point out right now is the credits too, because we were talking about this earlier about, you know, the auteur theory and whether that really does apply or not, because Anna Biller, the director is all over the credits in the opening of this movie. She is the writer, director, producer. Uh, she gets an editor credit in the beginning too. And I think costuming and set design in costuming the, in the and op- production design. Yeah. Yeah. In the opening as well. She's, she, I mean, this yeah. is her movie. 100%. There's no question that, you know, this, the, that anyone stepped in and said, mm, I don't think you're gonna be able to do that. Or like, you know what, why don't we go do this with the story or something like that? This is 100% from her head. I agree. I, I tend to be of the belief that auteur theory is bullshit, <laughs> that you know, <laughs> it kind of invalidates the uh, contribution of the rest of the production and sort of mythologizes directors, which I take issue with. But Ryan and I were talking about this uh, off air that, um, this is this is a case in which I feel like there's just no argument against yep. it. Um, DT and Joe, what do you guys think about auteur theory? Are you are you on board or are you like nah? I mean, in this particular case, I think you guys nailed it. She really did have so much to do with everything in this movie. But generally, um, with you, Laura, in in the grand scheme of things, I think it takes away from all the the you know. Everyone has an important role to play, you know, in the production of a movie. So I think it kind of detracts from contributors and really makes the director the central focus. But in this particular case, this is absolutely Ann Biller's movie, like 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and just kind of piggyback off that, I, I don't know, like, I, I, for me, you know, because I've read some things about it and like, you know, um, I, I think about Bob Fosse and like how his filmmaking journey and what he did, like he, he he basically wrote, directed, and edited the whole movie by himself. And so, if a director is able to do it, you know, and not compromise a movie or <laughs> everyone, not with everyone, with <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> production and team, people have seen all that jazz. <laughs> too. Oh, that's true. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. So yeah, I, I really don't mind it, but I, I do believe in like everyone should have their role, and you know, basically, you know, everyone has their role, and everybody should play it, but. In this movie, uh, I thought she executed well in terms of like carrying out the roles that she did play in this movie. Okay, so uh, back to the storyline. So then she shows up and she meets Trish. This is where you kind of get another like strange interaction at first, right? First, Trish goes, "Oh my gosh, you're so pretty," and I don't mean anything by that. I'm married, or I'm a <laughs> engaged, or whatever. Yeah, you usually right? don't <laughs> see women do no homo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 That was definitely a no homo yeah. moment. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and then so, and then they go inside, and she's like, "Oh, how do you know Barbara?" And she's like, "Oh, we used to dance in San Francisco." And sure, shit, Trish takes like a full minute to like check out her whole body judged yeah. oh. <laughs> and then moves along i also read it as like judgy but oh, maybe it really? was just purely sexual sexual okay so i actually have a theory uh f- for later in the film i think Ooh. that trish um actually gets seduced by her world and like Ooh. in that scene where she starts dressing up as her yes and I think that kind of leads to like trish's downfall and everything else so but we can get to Ooh, that i love I that yeah jump ahead a little bit but so, yeah, so then she, Trish takes her from the room and she's kind of making excuses. And then they walk in and it is this amazing apartment full of like technicolor, just bold, saturated colors that I love. Can we talk about that choice for one second? Go for it. And this is, this is one of those um, moments that I, I told you all about before where I can, I can state a fact and then I'm hoping maybe we can unpack what we think she was doing with that. Yeah, but like, yeah. so this color palette, she specifically chose from what's called the Thoth deck, uh, which is a tarot deck. But it's it's a weird choice because 
by far the most commonly used one, and actually there is imagery from it, and the deck that she uses is what's called a Rider weight deck. So the sauce one, even though it was painted by a woman, the person who commissioned it was Alistair Crowley, <laughs> who uh, was <laughs> – Brian's laughing – who uh, was a big occult figure um, in the early to mid-1900s um, who – uh, was really about sexual liberation. Uh, he himself was bisexual, um, drug user, libertine, and they also talk about libertines later. Um, but that he was also, at the same time, uh, generally a misogynist. Oh, um, And that uh, one of his biographers, uh, who was this guy? Uh, Martin Booth said uh, that he largely accepted the notion implicitly embodied in Victorian sexology of women as secondary social beings in terms of intellect and sensibility. So um, given that she specifically is not only using that palette, but explicitly calling it out and naming it, what do we think about that and maybe how it how it informs some of the politics of the movie or not. Whenever I think of Aleister Crowley, I always like think of him being alone and sad and he's like in a senior living home and he has no friends and he's all by himself is really sad. And it's terrible because Aleister Crowley actually did like a kind of like amazing things. But I do think he's also a narcissist an asshole and like very misogynistic and everything else. But anyway, so to pull from that color palette though is interesting. I don't know how I feel about that because I guess she pulled from him because of his influence over witchcraft and demonology and all that stuff, right? Is that what I, her nod was to Al that, that was my impression of it. Um, yeah, that would be my impression But of then it. if he is so well known as being sort of just like this dickhead who's like mean, but I guess he's mean to everyone, so I don't know if that even if matters to Hannah Biller or not. I feel like uh, Gahan or Gan or however you say his Gain. name also is kind of channeling, has some Crowley vibes. That, that yeah. definitely. 100%. That yeah. dude is such, yeah. <laughs> so gross. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing too, actually, on the whole um, production design thing, we should also, you know, mention that like I don't know if you saw in your research, Laura, but Biller said the movie wouldn't have been anything based off of the budget they had. So it took her seven years to get this film made because she was busy making all the props and all of the sets and, and all the costumes so that they right. would have the, a bigger like you know production value on the screen. The commitment when she was talking about you know she couldn't find the exact costumes that she want be, wanted because like certain fabric weren't the right color so she you know just built her own and went and got like vintage fabric and made her own clothes and that that rug that is featured you know that elaine kind of lounges on is like love me love me it yeah. it took her a year to hand pull it like wild. the again it's just the attention to detail and the commitment to uh realizing that detail i i don't know every filmmaker in the world so i can't say unmatched but it's pretty damn impressive <laughs> See, i'm gonna say something though as a first time viewer of this movie Go everything that i'm learning on this podcast makes me enjoy the movie that much more but my biggest gripe with this movie and what we've discussed so far is that it is so academic and I mm. wanted a horror movie, right? Yeah. Like what she did is amazing. And the message, and as I learned more from Laura, who just knows a shitload more than I do about any of this. So yeah, I know, like, right? I'm learning so much right now. She's, she's like, what did you think of like the Toth Terada? I'm like, shit, I didn't even pick up on that. So I have no comment. But, but like, but from like a pure entertainment, like horror thing, I think that's where I, and this is nothing like, it, it wasn't made for this purpose, but I didn't know anything about this movie until I clicked play, right? And I think that's what, a, as a first-time viewer, I wish I had known all of this because I think I would have enjoyed it more yeah. knowing that I was going into more of like an academic movie, which I, you know, for me is like good, you know, good on Anna Biller for like pulling it off, but like... I think it's so tough to do that with a horror movie, right? Like, I think it's really hard, especially for if, and this isn't a pure horror movie. In fact, I don't think there are very many scary moments in it. I have a tough no. time actually calling it a horror movie, but like for the genre, it, I don't think your audience normally wants an academic, you know, you, you kind of like are here for the cheap thrills and cheap scares. Right. So I don't know for, for me, that, that was, I think what made this movie so long because obviously I figured it out, you know, 
fairly quickly. But for like the first like, you know, 20 minutes, I'm kind of just like bumping along going, when's it going to get scary? (laughs) (laughs) So I just had a thought, but it's, I 100% agree with you by the way, Joe, uh, that it really has to be framed in a way that you're going to be ready for it. But if you go on the academic, like, okay, maybe this isn't meant for a lay person, which could or could not be true, but, um, but like academically, maybe the horror is, you know, a woman with power or, you know, that, uh, it's just like some of those gender roles that, you know, in, in not finding and maybe what you want doesn't exist. And, um, I don't know. So I haven't thought that through, but I think there are things to unpack. But to your point, all more heady than like the visceral that we usually yes. look for. And I personally also love in like, quote unquote, pure horror, whatever that means. I also have a, th- I have a question for everyone. And so, and this is again, off tangent, but slightly ba- like right in the back of Joe's uh, statement. Is this movie after COVID, after everyone has, you know, uh, spent a year, at least a year inside watching basically, you know, YouTube videos and TikToks and short form content that just goes, 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 goes fast, 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 fast. Does this movie become an even harder sell now for the general public because of its pacing and because of the way it's edited? Or do you think I it's, buy that. I don't know. I mean, I, yeah. What do you guys think? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which is a tough call because it does deal with themes though, too, that it's like are more, you know, relevant than ever. Granted, like this movie is 2016. It wasn't that long ago it was made. But at the same time, we also had like the Me Too movement. Look at Barbie just came out and I haven't seen it, but I've heard it is an amazing movie with a lot of feminist subject matter. And everyone's like right on board for that. So it, it seems like the message of this movie is pretty timely and, you know, pretty evergreen. And yet you know, I think it is, it might be harder to watch now that we, you know, have so, more, we've become more of accustomed to a faster edit pace, maybe even more so than like, this is my, ago. this is my, uh, every episode shout out to my fiance. Uh, <laughs> Nina, Nina watched this movie with me as she generally watches all movies. And she was on board that she did not particularly enjoy this movie. It was too slow. And then it, a few days later, we went to see Barbie and afterwards she loudly proclaimed five out of five. That's how you make a feminist movie, which I found <laughs> quite, quite hilarious. Uh, and uh, Laura, I know I mentioned that to you already. And as yeah. you aptly pointed out, there is more than one way to, you know, to, you know send a message of feminism. Well, so. And Anna Biller has been in a little bit of a Twitter tiff that uh, Ryan pointed yeah. out uh, because of a tweet that she did about Barbie that is, is like a whole thing and people misconstruing it. <laughs> but, but yes, other people have made that connection too. <laughs> Um, all right, so let's get uh, back to the story. Basically, in the apartment, Elaine goes, well, do you know of anywhere to get like a bite to eat? And Trisha's like, oh, I know the perfect place, a tea room. And she goes, perfect, let me get dressed. And then she like picks up her suitcases, goes to the other room, and then we cut to the tea room, <laughs> and it's pink everywhere. This and fucking you know, tea room. The lady on a harp in the corner. The outfit change by Elaine. <laughs> yeah, and like derby hats and like china and garlands right. and right. like the fruffiest of fruffy. Oh, wait, can we talk about one other thing first? I'm so sorry. Yes, go for it. Okay, so so Anna Biller um, is a multi-ethnic woman. She has a white father and a Japanese mother. Oh, and know. this movie is a very white movie. I think I counted two uh, people of color total in it. Yeah. And I have to think that given that, you know, she is a woman of color, that she's probably very aware and that's a deliberate choice and so what do we make of that is that like a comment on the lack of intersectionality and like because you know white feminine white feminism often gets criticized as being reductive and leaving other women out and um i just don't know if there's anything to explore there no i had the same thought as well and there was even a mention of like something later in the film where uh the professor was talking about like the different types of witches like there are black witches and the white witches and like and almost and I, maybe i'm like i i misheard but he was like describing like the, the black witches is like their practices being more savagery yeah. um at, you know <laughs> so it, 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 it kind of threw me threw me off yeah, like, so, wait what the fuck <laughs> 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 so, so, I'm like, so so but it's interesting i i, I don't know like it's like what once i saw the interview after i saw the movie and I, I've only seen it once, and then I, I looked up Anna Biller, and I saw her. I was like, oh, like, 
Um, it seems like she's she's Asian, so um, it's interesting how why she chose to kind of go this route with the movie. Yeah, and I was going to say to also to like cast yeah. basically the only uh-huh. two people of color in the police station is an interesting choice too. Yeah. Right? It's so weird. It's just strange. It's like you didn't extend out the cast. Like, I mean, you have a whole scene in like even like the go-go dancing scene or like, I mean, any of these, uh, the the tea room. I don't the think. Tea room, it's, yeah. it's, it might, I, I don't know if has she spoken publicly about this, Laura. Did you find anything on like why, well, like what was her decision process? I haven't oh, seen way, anything specific. My guess is she probably has at some point, but um, yeah. that just sort of occurred to me thinking, you know, the picture of that tea room and it is like. Yeah. Very hyper feminine and very, very white. Yeah, um, that's true. And I just have to think that's purposeful, but um, I, I have not yet sort of unpacked that fully yeah. for myself. There was one Asian. Was there? Yeah, during the LARP scene. She was like one of the, she was like a dancer before. before they oh, right, right. Yeah, that's right. She was up on the yeah, stage in the yellow. Yeah, so yeah, I will say that I little, also little, noticed yeah. the lack that's of uh, diversity in the film. And before I started talking to you all about this movie and how many layers to this onion, I was like, man, shitty casting. <laughs> I was seriously like, I was like, there could be something here, I guess. Like it did cross my mind, but I was like, they really did not hit the diversity of the casting here. That was my reaction. So that tells you guys that I need to watch this film again. Well, okay. Yeah, so I, I do, like I, it as well. I do know, you know, as far as like, you know, budgetary constraints, like she did hire a lot of her friends, right? Because she didn't have the ability to cast a wide net and get people to do a lot of pre-pro and everything else. So maybe that had some sort of effect where it was just like, she's just reaching out to people she knows and trying to cast as many people as she can within her small circle, maybe. I don't know. But I don't know. I I'd be, I would be really curious to see what she says. I, about I do think the the two black people being the police officers is a really interesting point that that has to be intentional. I, I, think I so. have to think so. Given the level of detail to the fact where she's literally hand pulling a rug for a scene, yeah. it's so meticulous. There's no way that she didn't think about that. Yeah. yeah. Especially as I know she has a master's in like some kind of film theory something. Like so there's no way that she didn't read about it or, you know, whatever, or probably has encountered it in her own experience as a woman of color who also sometimes acts, you know. She's she was the lead of her other movie Viva. Um, I think she's done some other shorts. So I don't know. Yeah. I'd like to hear her just talk about it and just like hear her whole overall experience as far as like casting. Get her on the too. horn. Yeah. She Let she might. Go. You know what? I will say, um, so she has a Twitter account and she's pretty active. She did retweet a podcast that covered her movie. And I was kind of curious. So I started listening to it. I only got in like 20 minutes. And this podcast kind of podcast kind of like shits all over her movie. I'm, I was surprised she retweeted it because I don't know, the people were kind of mean. So oh, maybe like maybe if you know no, she hears our no podcast. Press is like, bad press. Yeah, I guess yeah, so. right? sure. like, fuck sure. you. At least, you know, it's, it's starting a conversation and whatever. So it's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. So okay, so then in walks Richard and they, you know, they make the googly eyes with each other. And then I mean that's basically it. That's basically the sum up. Like he makes he talks a little bit to uh Trish about like he was, you know, on his lunch break and he was looking for her and they said she was here and he came to have lunch with her, blah, blah, blah. And then they make eyes with him and Elaine and you can tell something's going on there. There's, like there's that hilarious heart music. It's like, boom. But oh, you know, I, like, I forgot like, about the heart music, which, oh, by the way, Anna Biller wrote. She wrote that song and she wrote like the song at the Renaissance Fair too. So like, you know, Anna Biller just showing up everywhere in this thing. Um, and then... We get out of there and she goes to the park, which is the like a beautiful shot, by the way, because that's when like that technicolor feel really pops and that green grass just hits your eyes and you're just like, oh my God, like I want movies to be colored like this again, right? Like it's so beautiful when she sits down to eat her sandwich and she's just surrounded by this like beautiful green grass that you just, you don't see grass that color in films anymore because everything's so desaturated and just like kind of meh anymore. Did I read something about this movie was like one of the last or something of the the film stock that it was shot on? Did anybody come across anything about that? I didn't catch that, but I wouldn't be surprised. I really wouldn't be surprised. She said her DP, David Mullen, she said, did a extensive research into the movies they wanted to pull from. And so he was looking up film stocks. He was looking up lenses that like, he knew his lighting for this sort of a uh, picture. So I'm sure he probably did pull some classic film stock that may have been just the last of the last of whatever was available. And, you know, and they used it all up on this movie. So then she's sitting there eating her sandwich and she makes eyes with Wayne, the professor. 
talking to a blonde woman across the park and then he makes eye contact with her. And this is one of the few instances in the movie where they do a special camera move. Like most of this movie is shot sort of like on sticks and it's very like, just like over the shoulder and like blah, blah, blah. And this is the one time this is like the, and actually for me, this is like one of the more iconic shots of the movie. She's eyeing him in and then the camera does a push in on her face. And she does this, and it's really cool. If you notice throughout the movie, they only do this one move where it pushes in when she's seducing the men. So, like in every scene where you know she seduces one of the men, they do have a they have a push in shot on her. And this is this is one of those instances. And I I think this is a great moment too because like this almost feels like this. The reason why I like this shot so much is it almost feels like yes, it's part of this movie, but it could be part of any movie, and it has such sort of like an evil vibe to it. I think it's great. But could it because? So, like, you know, whenever she's on the prowl, she's wearing that really bright blue eyeshadow. Yeah. I think it's kind of like war paint and that she's hunting. You know, it's not just seduction, but it's like she's out in the field. It's, you know, one of those big cats like clocking a, I don't know, pizzelle or whatever they eat. (laughs) That's a good point. I didn't even think about that. That's a great angle on it. Wait, I have a more traditional horror witch question for everyone when she makes eyes with these men and then they you know they they fall for her right it's very very immediate and i was struggling the whole movie with deciding if there actually was any magic going on there or if that was just a comment on how easy it is to use like the female figure to attract the male gaze because she is a witch right so is there any spell work there or do we think that's just men saying i'm gonna I'm going to switch targets and go after this beautiful woman. Right. I think to your point, that's that's exactly right. She's she's hot first and a witch second. Right. Yeah. And that, yes, I think it, it she doesn't need to do all this stuff because they think she's pretty and would like come over it anyways. Yeah. And I, I and she does. Obviously, she does need to use her magic. And so you'll you know, you see that with her, every relationship. She does make them drink her little witch's brew. Um mm-hmm. But you're right. Yeah, she's definitely using like her attractive attractiveness to, you know, kind of bait them. I guess I was just wondering, do we think that her witch magic actually works in this, you know, universe in, in the yeah, in the universe that we're in? Or is or is it something that's just you know, hokey, hocus pocus. And really what's really working is her sexuality. Well, I was going to say, I, like for me, I I basically went along with it. I, I thought that her magic had something to do with it, but you could easily argue the other way too, I think, right? Yeah, to me, it's, you know, because we're getting the story from her point of view, right? It's subjective. And there's, I think there's an argument to be made for, you know, her trying to find the fantasy world wherever she can and like play yeah. the part of a princess and da, 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 da. So I think that we can debate as objective uh, spectators whether we think it's real or not, but I think she thinks it's real and that's sort of the important thing. Yeah. And for me, I mean, there's a few moments where I, you know, I went back and forth because sometimes I'm like, Oh, even the movie is kind of implying that the witch part of this is, is bullshit. Right. And then there's other parts like the end of the movie where they end. I won't, I won't say too much cause we'll get there, but where they end up at her apartment instead of the police station, you know, yeah. the, the unseen there, I was like, okay, there had to be some magic, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> there had to be, uh, there had to be something there. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And it's, it, but it's easy to sort of uh, bring that question into it too, because you, again, like we're in this world of hers, but there's all this modern sort of, things happening around them too right like right. there's you know updated cars and people in regular clothes and so it is like is this sort of just going along with like this wild fever dream of hers or is this you know really happening right because i kind of like wondered if she had like any like trance ability you know because every once yeah. in a while i kind of felt like a trance but again that's i mean even i not knowing that this was going to be a movie about feminism picked up on the, the <laughs> implications that i'm not that stupid <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a perfect segue to go back to stupid men. We can go back to her, uh, her meeting Wayne. And then, so yeah, so then she, um, she kind of like nails Wayne's personality right off the bat. Right. She's like, you look like an outdoorsy guy. I think it's like, you know, the way that, uh, what's his name? John Edwards or whatever, like the fake mentalist guy. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Does reads on someone like, Oh, you seem like you love nature and sometimes people can be a bit much. And he's like, wow, you know, my soul. Bitch, right. What are you talking you about? Right through me. Like, yeah. 
oldest trick in the book. And it's like, okay, as men, what do you, what would you make of a woman who, you know, does that and then is like, well, do you want to take a girl up to the cabin now? I, I don't know. He, you know, he thinks it's a joke, but then he gets into it. But I feel like that's pretty overtly dangerous, right? You know, 100%. like she's, yeah. she's using it as yeah. a weapon. And I, I'm like, oh, you're going to go somewhere with some chick you don't know. And I agree. And I would, I would like one immediate red flags. Two, that I'd be looking around me, seeing like where her friends are. They're, you know, they're going to jump out of a bush and mug me or something like that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I just, I wouldn't, jump, but I do have friends that would be like, hey, yeah, all right, let's go back to my cabin. You, you know what I mean? I do. I do, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was in a fraternity. I know a couple guys that would have done that. <laughs> but uh, no, my immediate reaction, uh, g- given who I am, I would assume that she's setting me up to be jumped. Uh, yeah. that's, uh, my immediate reaction would not be, let me take this woman back to my cabin in the woods. But good old Wayne. Wayne is, uh, I mean, she scouted him right. She's uh, a yeah, big, she big, big cat knows her target. So. <laughs> yeah, she loves nature too. Don't forget. That's right. Because that, yeah. she does. And she wants she's to a Wicca. Out. She's a Wicca. They're bonded. So, yeah, they're bonded. So then they go up to their cabin. Well, and, and like the red flags continue, right? Because he like, oh, he wants 100%. to get down to it right as they pull into the driveway. It's like, it'd right. be great, you know, if we could make love in the car right now. And so she's like, no, how about you drink this thing from a mysterious flask from a woman that you don't know? <laughs> you know, and he's just like, yeah, let's throw that shit back. And even if it's strong, it doesn't matter. Like finish it all. And he's like, yes, ma'am, I will. Yeah. Just for you. Yeah. I did really like that part where he takes a sip and he's like, oh, okay, it's strong. And she's like, finish it. And he's like, all right. <laughs> <laughs> but he, this is before she's told him that he's not going to get lucky in the car. Right. So like, as soon as he finishes it, he's like, all right, now and she's like, I'm going to go inside now. <laughs> it's great. So, <laughs> okay. And then we find out that she dosed him. <laughs> the drink hits. And it hits hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there are there are hallucinogens, uh, hallucinogenics in the in the flask that she made yes. of poor Wayne Chug. And uh, he is he is starting to feel it. Yeah, I mean, so this is when she describes him as a libertine, yeah. right? And by the way, he still, and we'll keep track of this, he still has not asked her a single thing about herself. But I thought was what was interesting is that she starts to dance for him like the whoa baby you're wild and literally she, when she starts dancing and the drugs kick in there is a deer with its head mounted on the wall right next to her and I literally wrote in my notes Molly you in danger girl like <laughs> Wayne is in trouble and like literally being compared to like a, a hunting trophy on a wall so I'm sorry my man just totally and they do that in the movie a lot because when she's talking to Griff at one point the painting of him dead in her arms is behind over her shoulder yep and so like they're constantly sort of like foreshadowing the the future of these men behind her Wayne like, though her. is especially in trouble because he is ostensibly a literature professor bro <laughs> learn a metaphor okay so they go to his bedroom and he's got those silk sheets just those yes. lovely <laughs> silky yeah. sheets and i actually think so and then they get in the sex scene and i think the sex scene actually is so well shot with the exception of the overhead shot of his butt I think it is so beautiful what they do with this sex scene because it's like they've got the, you know, the rainbow filters um, all over the place and it's shooting through like this beautiful um, sort of like glass filter with all these different like flares and glares and everything else. And I just like, I was, it's a really well done or well shot sex scene, I think. And it, mm-hmm. it, it does a lot of like really great um, editing, I think. And I actually don't mind the butt because, um, I, it's so rare, I think, for uh, the man to be exposing more skin, you know, yeah, and like no, having to be point. more vulnerable in it and looking kind of ridiculous the way, you know, women often look in sex scenes just based on how they're shot. Um, That's true. That's very true. I also really love, um, to your point of how it's shot, how disconnected but also performative um, Elaine is during this sex. Like she's been working so hard to get this dude. Right. And she's just like staring off into the middle distance. And actually, you know, the, the, there's a still from this scene that is the cover art. Right. But just, yeah. So I thought that was interesting that that's where that's from, but that, you know, she's, she's so, so dissatisfied because she's chasing that thing she can never get. Well, I mean, she gets him like she only wants to please her man. Right. Yeah. And it's kind of like, 
She's just getting, she's throwing away her like self for yep. this. But more importantly, Wayne is now crying. Well, that's true. <laughs> yeah, yes. so Wayne rolls Whoa, over crying. Bitch Wayne. <laughs> Which has completely, I mean, it already looked like it was kind of ruined for Elaine, but now it is just completely ruined for Dead. her now that that Wayne is crying. And I, doesn't she even call him a pussy at some point she in does. the movie? So like she asked Wayne. Like, like verbatim. Like I she literally don't, does. Yeah. Because... She spends this scene while he's sobbing, acting as mother. And, you know, there's I think there's a line later where they talk about women either having to serve as mother or whore or both to a partner. And so she's in mommy mode. And I love that he's crying about, oh, two things that I thought were hysterical. One, that he's like, no woman has ever given herself to me like that before when she a thousand percent did not. <laughs> and two, um, you know, when she's like sympathizing with him and like, oh, baby, life's been hard. And he literally, so while he's sobbing, he's like, all the women I'm attracted to aren't bright enough and all the bright ones are homely and don't arouse me and cries. And it's like, Horrible. Oh, shut the fuck up, dude. And he yeah. still has not asked her a single question about herself, by the way. Yeah, of course not. He's a shit in. <laughs> yeah. So literally then we cut. So she's like cradling him like a baby. And then it cuts to her smoking a cigarette. And she's like, what a pussy. And yep. I cackled. I thought that was great. <laughs> That's what I do. <laughs> so yeah. So then she sleeps on the couch and lets him cry all night long. And then in the morning she goes in and he's, you know, he's talking about how he doesn't feel good. And mm -hmm. she lets him go back to sleep while she goes and makes breakfast. And then she sees um, the tarot card, the heart with the three swords. So she has obviously done her research because the three cards that come up in her draw that she does are like the fucking bummer cards, cards in the tarot. There's like some that whenever you draw them, because you know, there are ones like death or whatever, where you can be like, it actually means change and it's not so bad. But these three almost never mean anything mm. good. So you've got, you know, the three of swords, which we've seen over and over, which, you know, may not surprise you that it normally means yeah. heartache. Um, but so then you've also got the five of cups, which is uh, like disappointment and sorrow. So she's bummed that Wayne mm. sucks, you know, and it's like not going to be it. And then the tower is like maybe the scariest or quote unquote worst card to pull because it's like danger. It's crisis. Oh, it's disaster and like um, destruction. So it's it's like pretty negative and I think points to like how quickly things are going to crumble and like, you know, Wayne is not long for the world. Because that's that's exactly what happens, right? She she sees those cards and she runs to Wayne to make sure he's okay. Yep. I also, okay. I also wanted to ask, like, I know like the same three cards keep coming up. Do, does, like, do each of those cards apply to one of the three victims or, or th maybe they're not victims, um, the three men that die or do we just think that? Well, yeah, I think, I think it's sort of maybe not a one-to-one -one because all these men are the same for her. Like she, in the way that they project onto her, she projects onto them and they could be anyone, you know, but I do think it's different with uh, later when uh, we have Griff as the, the knight of wands. But otherwise I think in general, like the one that we see over and over is that three yeah. of swords. And it's also like, she's sort of victimizing herself, which, you know, she should go see a therapist while well, she is seeing a therapist. She needs a better therapist. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that's what I've got right now about that. Is, the, is there a real therapist? Do you think her therapist is one of the witches in the coven? Ooh, right. Interesting. Well, also Anna Biller and Samantha Robinson code, uh, Elaine and interpret Elaine to be sociopathic and like in prep for the, for the, um, for the movie, they watched a lot of movies about sociopathic women. You know, it was oh, like, okay. I, I know all about Eve was on that list. I forget what exact else, but if that's true. And if we also accept that the movie is sort of like a, dist Elaine's distorted version of reality, it's totally possible that she has a real and legit therapist, but she just hears what she wants to hear and, you know, takes from it what she okay, wants. Okay, well, so that's actually really interesting then because in that podcast I mentioned where they were kind of wrong about a lot of things, there was one thing they said that I thought was interesting and kind of possibly right. They were talking about the end of this film and they said, you know, on the end um, in the dream sequence where um, 
they cut specifically to the band playing the music, but you don't hear it. And then you cut back to her getting on the whole, the unicorn and everything else. Basically, that is very much of like what um, the sort of like way a sociopath lives life where it's like they can hear the words, but they can't hear the music. And so visually, like they thought that that's Ooh. what this movie was doing was like, you know, she knows everything right to say and she knows all the the ways to walk down the path, but she's not going to be able to hear the music around her because just she's a sociopath. So I thought that was really, that was actually a really interesting theory there. Wow. And now you saying about the sociopath, you know, research, I'm like, oh, well, that, okay, yeah, that actually really does make a lot of sense. Um, okay, so Wayne's dead. Poor, Poor Wayne. Poor Wayne. Uh, she buries him and then she makes the witch bottle. So she says the tampon thing and part of me can be with Wayne now. Should we talk about what was in the witch's jar that she decided to protect uh, Wayne's grave with? Yes. Anyone want to go into the ingredient list? Well, what was it, Joe? What, what, go ahead, well, Joe. Well, uh, we have a, uh, we have looked like maybe one cup, possibly two cups of urine. Uh, <laughs> yes. uh, we have a used tampon. Uh, we have, what else is there? Was it sage? I couldn't. It looked like rosemary. rosemary? Okay. It did maybe look like sage. rosemary, yeah. Okay. Rosemary. Um, what else was there? That was really what I clocked. Well, there was the yeah. overhead shot of her pulling stuff from the bowls, though, uh, spoonfuls of stuff, right? Well, the guy, the guy talks about, um, or at the like the expert, right? That there's also like something sharp that goes mm. in it. I didn't yeah, see. I didn't see what it was for her, but um, but yeah, you you collect <laughs> the big ones, which is Lady yeah. P yeah. tampon, rosemary, which I think is meant to be kind of like an in your face of like yes you know women have bodily functions right. look at it yeah so i don't know point. and she walks it out and puts it on the grave basically leaves this trace of her on top of the grave and it's like people are gonna find that i wondered with like the year in if she was like if it was almost like a marking her territory thing with the, <laughs> like no i'm serious like oh i like, like it I, like, that's what I thought. Like when I saw that, I was like, oh, it's almost like she's marking like this. This man was hers. You know, this no one else's. Totally. And I think that is a great point, Joe, because it also goes into like there's like something later. I forget if she says it or if Barbara says it, but like about like her primal goddess power and what is more primal than like marking something with Pete. Oh, that's a good point. I didn't even think about that. But um, she goes back to the apartment and Trish comes over. <laughs> I also thought this is really funny that she's like, can I get you some tea? And there's already like this China set out like <laughs> on her table for two people. And she just like goes like, okay, Elaine. Um, oh, and she mentions that her husband, Richard, uh, or though that she's going out of town without husband Richard. Oh. And she does that. I think but they like really set up like her next victim coming. Before they go to the burlesque stuff, which is good. Did. But then the burlesque scene opens up with the bartender talking about a dead body. And I actually didn't catch this until like the fourth time I watched this. It's like he's not talking about any of her victims. He's talking about a completely random victim with a pentagram and yeah. she knew its chest. Like in a river. Yeah. And like, or what's something. that all about? Is that like is that another victim of the coven then? Is that what's going on there? I think maybe because we see later that, you know, the coven is complicit in uh, helping Elaine with all this yeah. stuff. So maybe they're just up to like spooky bullshit all the time. Well, <laughs> I don't know. I, I was just going to say later in the movie, the police also, I, I mean, right. I, it's, it's a little stilted, but you know, the uh, Griff says we, you know, we always leave the witches alone or, or whatever. Like that's like the San Fran or not San Fran, the, wherever they are up in the, uh, the town's policy is to leave the covens alone. So oh, that's not what I was going to say. Yeah. I was oh. going to say his his partner when doing research, remember, he, uh, said she joined a coven in San Francisco, but the coven had to break up because people were en people were ending up dead. Yeah. Disappearing. And, stuff. and so I'm wondering if that's like, if they're just back to their old ways in this small little town, basically then. So then we cut to our girl Elaine talking to Barbara. Barbara is back in town and now she's, you know, filling Barbara in on like, yeah. you know, there was a man, Wayne, and it just didn't work out with him. And they start getting into um, the love magic and how, you know, he kind of lost his mind. And Barbara warns her, she's like, that love magic is really strong. You have to be careful. And then mm -hmm. Gain comes in. I will just point out two things. Uh, one is that Elaine's eyeshadow, this is the first time we've seen it and it's not that bright oh. blue. It's like a subtle purple. And I thought maybe that that was about Barbara is the first woman we've seen her talk to 
who she feels comfortable with and like can be herself with. So there might be more to that, but that like the war paint is off. And I think it's interesting that, uh, you know, we pick a burlesque show because, you know, she's even though this whole movie has been about her using her sexuality to get to get what she wants, like she's not there to dance. She's there to yeah, watch. Yeah, that's true. And I was I, I think I'm, I'm going to watch this whole movie again just to track the makeup. <laughs> <laughs> It, yeah, I do. Cause that's just one thing that did not register in my mind whatsoever, but that's really interesting. I'm surprised that that wasn't number one on your <laughs> list. Like, of things what track. is her shade of eye color in this scene? What's going on? <laughs> uh, but yeah, you're right. No, but and, and she's there to watch. She's not there to like perform or show off or display mm-hmm. anything in that scene. And she's also talking about, again, sort of like the balance of power between men and women in this scene too, which is interesting. She's mm-hmm. sitting in, you know, a, a go-go dance bar where, you know, Right. And like, like, it's weird because Barbara, who's supposed to be this like liberated witchy lady, right? Like when Elaine's like, boo, I'm so sad, you know, that Wayne died. She, Barbara like gently, but does admonish her. And it's like, well, you need to be more careful. And it's like all of that love and great sex you were giving him. So like next time dial it back. Which is interesting because isn't she, isn't Barbara. Okay. My impression of Barbara and Gain is that they're in some sort of relationship, Right. Or am yeah. I wrong? Maybe yeah. that's, that's what I, I think. Thought. If it's not, yeah, and if it's not, if it's not like a traditional like romantic partnership, they definitely have a partnership in their practice. Mm. You know, like I, I get like high priest, high priestess mm. sort of gotcha. things, but and I also get probably that gains the type of dude who is like. I'm going to sleep with whoever I want. So yeah. I don't know, like whatever intimacy he has is not going to be exclusive to Barbara. Yeah, and with him, I, I pictured him as sort of like, um, like a Catholic priest sort of abusing, you know, the yeah. rituals and everything else in his favor. Yep. So that's just the way I read mm-hmm. him and the way I, I think it's portrayed. Yeah. Totally. 100%. He's there because as high priest, he gets to have sex with like the female and anyone who wants. Yeah. yeah. Ugh. I have something that I want to raise that might not make it into the final cut, but I just didn't know what to do with it. So, you know, the drunk dude stands up and is like, go home, witches. You know, we don't take kindly to your right. type. But then it becomes this kind of like, this is what w- a conversation that would happen among queer folk in like a regular bar of like, you know, just ignore him. They're always going to give us trouble. And th- especially the line like, I didn't know this town was hostile to witches. And they're like, well, it's certainly not San Francisco. But so I don't really know what to make of that other than than just like both groups being other. Hmm. Yeah, I did, I kind of took it at face value when I first like watched it, but now that you point it out mm-hmm. again and having seen the rest of the movie I, and what we've talked about, I think there probably is a little more to that. Obviously, you know, that's it, it's too pointed of a line to not to not mean mean mm-hmm. a little more than just you know local townsfolk don't like right. witches in their bar, you know. Is he attacking the witches because they represent a certain type of woman that they don't want, right? Because they're at this go-go bar. They're watching women perform for them, and they have women serving them with drinks. But then there's this table of women who are not taking part of any of that, and they represent something that is a little more individualistic and a little bit more, like, independent, right? So you have these people there, which is, like, are looked at as sort of, like, this woman who, you know, hunts her prey or like goes out and does a certain thing. She's not there to serve the man. She's there to serve herself and do whatever she wants. And so they don't represent the type of woman that they're looking for in the go-go bar. And that's why there's still like that friction there. Which I buy, but it's also interesting because these witches are all about the burlesque. So I think it's Gain that says this first, like dancing is a powerful thing for women and girls. Uh, The burlesque dancer has power because all witches need to figure out where her power lies. We believe that a woman's power lies in her sexuality. We don't view it as satanic or anti-feminist, but as a celebration of woman as a natural creature, an earthly body, a spiritual essence, and a womb, which I want to get back to if we actually buy that he means that, or if it's just like an excuse for him Total to excuse. watch yeah. basically. And he's telling dance. that to the twins, the blonde twins. Who have, who have yeah. them. Yes. To the twins, but also to Elaine, just like, you know, as like a general, like, listen to me, talk yeah. about what yeah. we do. But the whole history of witchcraft is interwoven with the fear of female sexuality, which we talked about already. And that, you know, when uh, it talks about like women being bounded to marriage and being made into servants, whores and fantasy dolls, which we've seen, 
all three of those right already but and you know if you watch like because like usually in this movie people have like pretty neutral facial expressions and like it tends to be kind of wooden but when she's talking about that the women around the table have like genuine sorrow yeah which is pretty interesting but but that they do like even though they're coming at the burlesque in a different way that they also embrace it so like you know the 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 dude is like you're different and they're like well yes but also not <laughs> articulate like that Look, i should have just called anna biller she should have just come out on this call with us yeah i think we need her. <laughs> i i think we need her to clear up some of this <laughs> i think i think you're, i think you're right though i think you're right though ryan about um the maybe they're they're saying they don't want witches in the bar is is that they just don't want like free thinking women in the bar in the burlesque house. He's so, so gross. gross. So, 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 okay. So she's at home, right. And she's putting on the lotion and, um, kind of getting ready for bed. And you've got the VO, the voiceover of her father asking her if she's crazy or if she's stupid. Oh yeah. Before that is Jerry. Jerry's, you know, obviously like riding her ass about like not cleaning up at the house and like not making meals for him. And like this, it's sort of like, it sounds like a very verbal abusive relationship. And then she, yeah. we go to the bed and she's getting compliments now in her head and, and she starts masturbating. When Biller posited that this movie is a tragedy, I think this is where we're getting into it, where she's like, she's fantasizing about like after she's been so degraded of like, you know, oh, now you've lost weight and you're hot and whatever. And like she's masturbating to getting just a, a crumb of approval after being, you know, to Ryan's point, verbally abused. Yeah. And then yeah. this this session with Gain takes over where she's we're basically seeing the original flashbacks from the very beginning of the movie in yes. context of what of her, I guess, I'm assuming being accepted into the coven, probably. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's like yeah. an initiation, right? It's initiation, right? So she's like on her knees and she's got her hands and her legs tied behind her back and there's a blindfold. Yeah. And then they move her to the altar and, yep. you know, Gain does his bullshit and then climbs on top of her and essentially yep. rapes her, I assume. So, yeah, probably. And that's why we that's why we find out that like she doesn't want him kissing her because she doesn't like him whatsoever. Right. Because he's disgusting. Um, yeah. But then we go to uh, back to Sergeant Griff or is, no, is this what we're meeting him or not <laughs> based on whether he's the cop in the beginning? But this is like <laughs> the first time we've seen him like that we know for sure it's him right <laughs> right 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 yeah i think you're okay. right because uh, yeah it's it's him coming out of uh his office and right, right? and the female officer going hey congratulations yeah. on the promotion He's which like, to the earlier point is one of the only t- uh two black people in the movie um is yeah he's introduced with her like coming at him pretty hard yeah and he's like you know the sort of chiseled jaw like you, you know a, like stock character of the handsome cop he's very square <laughs> the elf yes yeah i mean totally wooden and stuff too but totally in terms of wooden. looks she's she's looking for a prince and i think you can read pretty quickly like okay he's at least checking some of those boxes and then, so then yeah. what the, the, what, the, the student the, like the woman she shows, she shows up and she's like hey you know professor wayne he's been missing and um you know we should go check it out. So they're going through the house and they, they find all the rotten food and they're kind of like investigating and they're like, oh God, this is disgusting. And they go in the back and they see the uh, rainbow jacket and the witch's bottle. Yeah. I know this is just like um, procedural, but did anyone else find it funny that the student followed them throughout the house as like they're investigating? Right. The, like right. She's literally like, like contaminating every scene and then right. like stands over them while they're like clearly going to be digging up her dead professor that well, she obviously has an emotional attachment yeah. to. No, yeah. I love it in the way that like, I love, you know, while, while Richard is eating the cake that, you know, Elaine takes him over to the couch and is doing like the poor baby, whatever. And she gives him like a Pee Wee's Playhouse glass, like size glass of <laughs> yes. wine. It's like the biggest cup I've ever seen in my life. Um, and I don't know why we do that, but I'm glad that we do. And then, of course, you know, they start making out on the couch and she she has that line like she calls herself the love witch. I am your ultimate fantasy. So, yeah. you know, cue the Leonardo DiCaprio meme of like, you know, she said the thing. From point of the <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she, she had the titular line. Titular line. Yes. <laughs> yes. And but yeah, she has purposefully molded herself and changed herself into what she thinks 
he's going to want. And th- I mean, this this happens so much faster as far as like the ending of it, right? Like, yeah, it's with like this, and then we don't see much else except for like flashbacks. No, to yeah, so we and him depressed, right? Like we've got it's like Griff like investigating some more and like, you know, learning more about the witch bottle and practices, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, that's, that's sort of what's going on with that. And then there's like the, this like outdoor ceremony that we watch. Yes, yeah, so where they dance around to, the fire. Yeah, I don't know if yeah. I have anything except that I did love. I thought it was hysterical that like they had an after party with like canapes. <laughs> you know, like that, <laughs> that was the best. My favorite thing ever. And we cut to... The apothecary. The apothecary. That's right. And that's where Griff is um, doing more of his investigation. And that's where he yeah. learns of Elaine. That's where he finds yeah, her. Because the, the, the shopkeep with whom like Elaine had had, you know, it, it felt kind of like cold and rigid. Like, you know, it was transactional or whatever. But like this chick has no problem selling Elaine right up the river. She's like, this is her name. Here's where to find her. Do this. snitch. <laughs> <laughs> And then he and then he shows up at Elaine's apartment. Yes, and she's doing like potion brewing, but like very intense potion brewing. Right. And she goes to the door, and she's very defensive, and she doesn't you know doesn't want him around at first. Nope. And then but he then, what changes that vibe? What? Okay. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. So here's what it is. So like he comes in, and she's giving very like a cab vibes, right? When he first right. comes in, it's like go away. No, I'm not going to see you. But then you can almost see a light bulb go on where she's like, oh ho, I know how to deal with police, and. So then she pivots and she's going to use her sexuality to get out of trouble like she did with the ticket. And it's funny because she literally has a smoking cauldron like bubbling behind her and she she goes to check it out. He's like, are you a witch? (laughs) Well spotted. But like, so she admits to it. She's like, don't come at me just because I'm a witch. And, you know, starts to cry. And so then he's like, oh, no, and goes to comfort her. And then she turns the charm all the way up to 11. And I feel like because he's even just shown the tiniest sliver of being gentle. You know, we hear the flute music. She's already in gr- like uh, integrating him into her fantasy of the prince. Um, yep. And she's like, you're the man I've seen in the cards, uh, which is the Knight of Wands, which is a card about passion and creativity and going after what you want. So pretty on the nose, but she's like, God damn it. He's going to be my prince. He's taking more horseback riding. I'm going to finally be a princess. While she's standing behind that table with him talking to her and she's you know, yeah. giving him her sob story, the picture of him dead is behind her over her shoulder. <gasps> ah, I, yeah. I missed that, but yes. Yep, yep, yep. So I love that. Okay. A little again, once there. again, all of these men have had chances to sense danger, but then they go horseback <laughs> riding. So, yeah. okay, so they're they're riding. She like they're dressed in white and billowy, and it looks very like, you know, like romance novel cover, or at least he does. Yeah. And um, so then they they come upon a fair with a jester and like a bunch of folks dressed up like uh yeah, like they're going to Ren Fair. So we see like couples laughing, they're drinking, they're having a good time. At what point did you realize that it's the coven? Because it took me an embarrassingly long time. That's a good question. I think it was. I think it was when you actually see them on stage, uh, Gain and Deborah. Yeah, or Barbara. I, Barbara, excuse me, Barbara. Me too. I was like, yeah. What? Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> but then it's, and that's really happening too, right? Like that's not a dream sequence. Like that really. I don't happened. think so. Um, yeah. Okay. And here's something else that's weird that I wonder what you'll make of. And spoilers, it's a preview for something that happens towards the end. But so, okay. So as you said, uh, Gain and Barbara are dressed as like a king and queen. And they're they're going to introduce this little play about the Oak King and the Holly King, which are real. That's like a real story, real legend. And so the Oak King represents summer and the Holly King represents winter. And like, in the story, they're, you know, doing battle and like as they go back and forth, it's like the the seasons are changing or whatever. So uh-huh. so it's weird because they are celebrating midsummer, but the Holly King wins in their version, who is the king of winter. So it's backwards. But I'm not uh-huh. really sure why. But I think again, because Biller is so educated with this stuff. This has to be a choice, especially compounded with what I'm going to point out later. But I'm just wondering if you have any preliminary thoughts on that. No, I didn't see. I didn't even know about that whole thing with uh, interesting. 
But um, so then they like propose the fake wedding and sing. I, I wrote down, sorry, Anna Biller. They sing for a thousand million years. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess okay. So you're right, and that that song just like goes on way too long. And, <laughs> but it does like it does like do its thing, right? Or kind of like yeah, hits the it, theme it, it again. Gets us in, there's yeah. also like a pretty on the nose line about pretending is also real. So right, you know, exactly. at, at this point, like her reality and her fantasy are getting all mixed up in each other, and it is probably not going to turn out great because that's not how things actually go. I, I question every time I've I've watched this. It's like, man, how much, how far into her head are we here? Right. But then, but then we also cut to the VO of him and her. So it's like, right. That, that's the only thing I'm. So it's like, well, okay, what's I'm not necessarily in her head then because we're also right. hearing his thoughts. So, so does it just mean that her coven is like comprises the best wingmen ever because like they're putting right. on this like wedding there's a wedding cake that they sit down to and like Griff right. is totally going along with it which is also weird and like Very then he's strange. got the voiceover where you're like okay so he's not totally had the Kool-Aid yet but it's weird that Griff is just going along with it and not only going along with it but like having a good time yeah well uh, but he's going along with it for purely narcissistic reasons right like he's like oh, I want an air right. one day I'm not in love with this person, but I want an yes, air one day. Yes, yes. Yeah. And I loved how the voiceovers were so pointedly, like, diametrically opposed, where she's like, <laughs> right. knowing more about someone and embracing their imperfections, you know, and he's like, uh, as you get to know women were, uh, you're less attracted to them. Blech. Drowning in estrogen. <laughs> yes, yes, drowning in estrogen. But it's interesting. It is a different approach for him, for the relationship this time, right? Because now she's engaging with a man who does not want to be in love or do, cannot fall in love maybe i don't know that's I, I right. Guess, right i think it's both i think he's made a choice not to well yeah. so yeah so i wonder if maybe he would have been capable but it doesn't matter because he's actively chosen that he won't yeah and so he does like he doesn't fall for her trap no which he also tells her later like nikki <laughs> it's not working on me <laughs> okay <laughs> So we have this fake wedding and then we go to the yeah. police station and, you know, his partner, Steve, who is the only other black person in this movie other than Connie, is like, I found out more about Elaine. And like Griff is like what we talked about before, like law enforcement says, like, leave them alone. But Steve is like, um, she's probably like connected to a bunch of murders and she probably killed her ex. <laughs> like, don't you want to hear about this? And Griff is like. No. And Steve no. is like, are you serious? So Steve, Steve accuses Griff of being love, in love with Elaine. And I wrote, they have a hilarious physical altercation. Boom. Sucker punch in the face. Boom. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. So that's a good point though. So is he in love with her or is, is this like sort of like the, um, the beginning of where he's learning that maybe she's not like a proper mate I for think him? I don't think it ever gets to love. I think maybe he's getting to a place of infatuation, but then it's making mm. a pretty clear point that those are not the same thing. Okay. So, yeah. So Trish finds Richard, right? Like Trish goes upstairs yep. and finds him in the bathtub and he's killed himself. Yeah. Uh, he has died by suicide. He has slashed his wrists. Um, and so she, she screams and actually it's really heartbreaking, you know, cause Trish is like, I really thought he loved me for me, but thinks like, this is her fault because she didn't give him the fantasy. Um, and That's true. I think it's interesting, too, because then she talks about the affair. So she knows it happens. And I wrote down, Elaine looks like the cat who swallowed the canary. She yeah. is like so self-satisfied in that moment. Also, Trish tries to take agency back in that moment of being like, this is my fault. I should have helped him. Yeah. And I have a frowny face. Girl, do not take this upon yourself. But, you know, so she is. She's like, what else could I have done? Um, and I think you mentioned before, but yes, Trish is now in like black, black yeah. and Elaine is wearing white. Um, and so poor Trish, because, you know, so she's, she's burying her soul and then she's like, you know, enough about me, what's going on with you. And Elaine, who could not read a room if her life depended on it, <laughs> is like, oh my God, I think I'm in love. And right. she, she shows Trish what's essentially like a promise ring and Trish tries it on and is like all wistful and stuff. And Elaine, rather than comforting her like a human being is like, bye. <laughs> like leaves Trish by herself. With and it's the, the ring. ring from the from the fake wedding, right? Like so she's like Griff gave me this ring, but it's not even oh, like is it? Yeah, it's like he didn't oh. give it to her. It was presented to them at the Renaissance Fair. It's to your point that she's like rewriting history constantly yes. in her head. And so it's like it just yeah, shows you how much. Oh, that's a, a good catch. I did not notice that. 
Okay, so she's wearing the ring, and but then she like calls Elaine and says like, "Oops, you left your ring, uh, but don't worry, I'm going to come drop it off." Yeah. And it's great too because she uses a cell phone and it's like one of those, you know, it's just yeah. like a, a, like one of those garish reminders that it's like, yeah, they're in this like weird, this world of like 60s fashion and influence. Right. But then they're still living in the modern world. You know what I mean? Exactly. And it's like it just kind of pops the bubble every now and then. It's kind of fun. Yeah. Like Biller has been pretty adamant about the fact that it's not a period piece. Okay. So she goes back to the house, which you think is amazing. I think looks like a doll's house, which, okay. So, so Trish goes upstairs and then what happens? She goes up there and she starts, you know, she, well, okay. Sorry. Well, okay. I'll back up a little bit. She goes yeah. to Elaine's to drop off the ring. She yes. walks right in because the door's unlocked and Elaine right. isn't there. Right. Right. And she goes and, to drop off the ring, to put it in the yep. little thing. And then she kind of yep. like takes a She goes to leave too. Around. Yeah. She goes to leave. But then she's like, hmm. Hmm. Well, okay, you know what? I'm going to go take a look around. So anyway, yeah, so then to the good part, she makes it to the bedroom where she starts putting on Elaine's clothes and yes. her wig and her makeup. And it's like, I, I think I read the scene as Trish, you know, wanting Elaine's life, right? Like, yes, she she thinks Elaine is beautiful. She thinks Elaine has everything now and she has nothing. And she she's coveting whatever this is of Elaine's. And it's it's like, too, because, you know, just at the tea room, she was literally just saying, maybe I should have given him the fantasy. And so right. now she gets a tangible way to be like, OK, well, what what does fantasy Trish look like and how do I yeah. perform fantasy Trish? Yeah. Which goes into because she's she's, you know, been in these pastels. She she hasn't really shown she's she's alluded to the fact that she's used sex before, but like we haven't right. seen it. But right. then she's poking around in the drawers of this vanity and she puts on a set of like these hot pink lacy undergarments, yeah. um, <laughs> which I feel like is sort of a visual middle ground between her and Elaine. And there's also yeah. like a fuzzy, a pink fuzzy robe that has a trim that looks like a boa. And she's, you know, she's in it. And she's yeah. loving it. She's feeling it. Totally. Yep. And then she looks over on another vanity, I guess, in the room, right? Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, I think this is like, I, I read this as like kind of an altar, but yeah, I don't uh, know. Oh, but yeah, point, yeah. Like a, or like a shelf or whatever. But maybe she has a bunch of vanities. Who can say? Yeah. And she sees Richard next <laughs> to all of her other victims. Yes, the, the altar of dead dudes. The altar of dead dudes, right. And so then she's, she's sort of mortified and she opens up the drawers and she finds all these little like wrapped up sacks with men's names on them and opens Literally up. Literally labeled with their names. <laughs> Again, <laughs> Elaine is not good at hiding anything. No. <laughs> <laughs> and she has like the birthday card with their picture in it together. <laughs> like she could not be more obvious about what's going on. So, so Trish is devastated. Um, and meanwhile, Elaine is creeping up silently behind her with a dagger. Yeah. But Trish gets the better of her and like pushes her to the bed. And it's interesting because, you know, as as Elaine is sobbing and Trish is like getting into her, she she uses the words bitch, skank and whore, which like it's I don't know, that's a really interesting choice to me because it's. Uh, like such an easy, but I don't know, like it's a way that women are taught to tear other women down. Hmm. So while the physical violence is taking place, she's calling her these names that other women use to degrade and take women down a peg. So I thought that those were like pretty interesting. Okay. So, so we go from that back to the burlesque show where like the twins from before are now performing and Griff is there watching in the audience. Right. And, and they make it a point that these girls are witches, but they're also really bad dancers, right? Yeah. The, the, <laughs> the waiters say that. Speaking of like women tearing other women down, like the way that we're introduced to them dancing is one of the female servers being like, they suck. They're so stupid. Blah, 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 blah. Like these right. women are shit talking these Young, I mean, they're not young girls, but like they are, they are younger women, um, you know, and are being far more vicious than any of the men are. Um, so I don't know. I think that's interesting given what just happened. And Elaine shows up in this like red collar high dress. 
And it's kind of awesome with all the red lighting too. Like it is so strong and bold and it's awesome. Which is interesting because like she's, she's fucked at this point. Right. But she plays this scene like she has the upper hand, which she a thousand percent does (laughs) not. So then Chris is like, you know, we can connect your DNA to Wayne, like you're screwed. And so Elaine literally says, so I was a bad girl. Are you going to punish me? You know, and it's like, She's still trying to use like the old tricks in the book to try to um, try to get out of it. And it's like, but actually not even because she's she's owning it. But she's like, well, these men died of love. And Griff is like, that's fucking stupid. So one of the women who was shit talking the the twins is like, oh, my God, it's 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 her. Him or not. And, <laughs> yes. And then everyone in the club, it looks like up in the club is men. And they're like, burn the witch, burn the witch. And they rip off all her clothes. Yeah, because. They, they want to rape her. They want to burn her. They want to yep. rape the witch. Right. Exactly. So, like, they have her on the floor. She's like, oh. And so Griff rescues her from the mob, who's literally right now a knight in shining armor, um, like the card that she was talking about before. And she drives uh, and he drives them away in the police car. I think this is also a call back to, you know, when they shouted out in the earlier go-go scene. It's like, you know, witches get out because they can't control them and they're not playing into the feminine ideal that those guys want at the bar. The rape is the men trying to get the upper hand on her, right? Because she's, she's an individual and she, you know, she's trying to do her own thing. Real life rape is often used in a punitive way. Exactly. Exactly. And so I think that's really where that comes from because it is like they're yelling (laughs) burn the witch, but then they immediately just start, you know, undoing their belts and they're pulling her clothes off. Oh yeah. Like they're going to show her who's boss and put her back in her place. Yeah, exactly. And to me, I mean, you know, when we were talking about before, like, is this a horror film? That part to me is horrifying. So they go back to her altar of dead dudes, which (laughs) now now has Griff's police badge on it. And I said, "Uh oh, we know that look. (laughs) So she's like, yep. So she's she's ready to go. I just I don't understand. Like, why did they go back to her house if he said he was going to arrest her? Like, I think at this point. Even more so, fantasy and reality get blended together. Um, oh. So, so I'm thinking it's kind of like fiddly, like what you know, what is the truth of all this? And and in fact, she goes to comfort him in the way that she has the other men, and's like, oh poor baby, but he shuts her down. Yeah. So yeah, so she she comes on to him, and he's like, nah. And we see the three of swords again. Like, yes, we get it. She's heartbroken. Right. But his face turns into a skull. So do you think that that's her choosing? Like, that's the moment where she is going to kill him? I don't know. Is that... I, I think it's like the, the 404 error. You know, like, she can't project it onto him anymore because he has shut down the ability for that fantasy to be real. Like yeah. she can't justify it in any way because he's like said in sort of no uncertain terms. Now I want to tell you <laughs> something that I've been sitting on and actually this is the moment that made me go, holy shit, the attention to detail in this movie is blowing my mind and I have to read everything about everything. Oh, lay it on me. Oh, okay, this is so good. So so before when she was um, getting ready to attack Trish, she had a white hangle, handled dagger which is something called a bowling knife okay. but in this she has a black handled dagger which is called i, I found it pronounced a couple different ways like a, a mafe or a mafe, like emphasis wherever but it's this this black hang, handled dagger that she then is going to use to stab him to death this knife specifically in like pagan rites is meant to only for channeling psychic energy. Like in the tarot, uh, the swords are like the mind deck. So it's it's uh, the mind suit. So it's, it's completely meant to be used in a symbolic way. And not only are you not supposed to harm someone with it, you are never supposed to use it to cut anything. Like that oh. white knife is what you use it for instead. And it's like very specifically that's its thing is like it's used for the one purpose and you are not to use it in any other way as a knife so so what do we make so we have like the the conflation of the holly king and the oak king before and now we have her using like a sacred object that is literally about not harming someone to kill someone and you know like stabbing is an act of penetration and intimacy like i feel like there's a lot to read into the choice of this weapon is it, but is it more just like her misuse of witchcraft? Is it I her think, abuse of the system? 
I think maybe, yeah, that like she's been using it for her own means. And like, yeah. again, that she's been like so apart from that community. She's she's not doing it necessarily for self-empowerment or growth or whatever, but she's doing it to just further her chase of this perfect man who doesn't exist because she's that woman in love who doesn't have an identity without these guys. So she fantasizes about him dressed as a prince saying he wants to marry her. Um, And we flash back to their fake but maybe real wedding. They kiss. She smiles. Um, And so then then the, the coven folk dressed as like the mummers from the fair bring in the unicorn from her painting <laughs> um she gets on there was also in the renaissance fair remember the fake unicorn dancing behind the, the yes folks in that's gold? right yeah. that's right so now it is real now maybe, it is but real. also yeah fantasy and absolutely not real right. so so griff starts to lead it away and she has her prince but he's only in her head the jester starts crying and there's like this spilled chalice of blood in the painting, which in addition to the literal like spilling of blood, meaning that you've killed someone, the chalice in the tarot um, is like the feminine suit that uh, is about like emotion. So, you know, she's been like overcome. Mm -hmm. This love stuff has all gotten like ruined and messed up. So it's been, you know, tipped over. But despite the fact that like everything has gone to shit and she's probably going to prison, she smiles beatifically. And then that song that goes on for 8 million years comes back in. (laughs) (laughs) What do you think happens to her after this? Do you think she moves on to, I mean, I, I, well, yeah, she probably, my guess is, yeah, that she, I don't know how she's going to get out of legal trouble, but somehow she is because yeah. things just seem to work out for her that way. She's just going to keep driving down. You know, she's making her way south. Next time she's going to like, you know, uh, cause all kinds of problems in San Diego. Yeah. I think you're right. I, I think it is. It's a very like cyclical thing, right? Where it's like, it truly is. Like she she's killed trapped. Jerry and so she came here and now she's killed all these guys and she's got to move yep. on to the next town. So you yep, can easily do like a sequel where she just moves to the next city. Oh, totally. It's a cycle yeah. that she's doomed to repeat. And you could even look into maybe, maybe that's where like the Holly King and Oak King fight comes in because that's oh. cyclical and eternal and like someone smarter than me is gonna, you know, <laughs> write, write a really great grad paper about that <laughs> and then i want to be credited in, in their notes god damn right we better be like n- noted all over this paper because i feel like we wrote the paper for them <laughs> we wrote the paper for them that's um, right <laughs> okay so that was it um let's know what you think check out our show notes because we'll have a ton of links to uh additional uh, information you can look up on Anna Biller as well as the movie The Love Witch and definitely check out The Love Witch if you haven't and then also check it out again if you have because I think we have made a case that there's a heck of a lot more going on in this movie than people initially you know um, see on the first watch right? A thousand percent. A thousand percent. <laughs> All right. <laughs> If you want um, subscribe we are going to be posting this uh, episode on YouTube with our little animated version. We also have the podcast link in the YouTube version show notes, and you can follow us on Twitter and we are on Instagram and, and, and subscribe to our newsletter because we're going to be doing special write-ups just to like, you know, you know, sometimes you like you get burned through everything and then you got like a whole week until the next, whatever drops and you want to, you know, stick with us. And so (laughs) there will be doing a a couple more writing things and throwing them in a newsletter every week. And you can stick with us for a little bit longer. And we'll also be doing uh, a contest. We got these really cool little contest. Yeah. 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 So you should just join for the hell of the contest, but we have like these little horror Lego like guys and they're amazing. I'll show to you um, after we stop recording so you can see what I'm talking about. It's really okay. cool. We're just going to shoot them out to people every awesome. week. We'll have a little drawing. So, But I'm going to intercept them and keep them all for myself. <laughs> yes, you should. I want to myself. <laughs> Seriously. All right. That is that. Uh, everyone, have a nice day. Have a nice evening. Have a nice morning. And uh, we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye. I actually can't stop recording because it's Joe's in control and I don't know where Joe went. Bye.